Hello and a very warm welcome to Sporting Lives, where we look at uh, the life of somebody involved in sport with distinction. Uh, in whatever way that's manifested itself. And in the case of my guest this week, um, he's mainly been doing that as an official. He, uh, of course, was one of the best referees to have blown the whistle in the sport of rugby league. Two World Cup finals to his name, two Grand Finals and four Challenge Cup finals. Currently, the International Rugby League Match Officials Manager. He's worked in British weightlifting. Um, he's also played uh, cricket with distinction for Cheshire and he was made an MBE back in 2014. My pleasure to welcome Stuart Cummins. Thank you, very nice to be here. Um, so congrats on this latest role. How are things going with that in the early stages? Uh, last couple of months, I think you've been officially appointed. Well, the appointment was made um, middle of December, so we've got a, a little bit to work on over the next uh, few months. Tell us about more about the role itself. What are you actually going to be doing? What is a, an international rugby league match officials manager? Is it, is it the first? Are you the first person to have held this role? Yes. Um, ironically, I was um, asking the international or the RLEF, or sorry, the RLIF as it was in those days, uh, as far back as 2008, that uh, saying that this role should be in place. That we needed one person in charge of referees. Because, as you know, in uh, international rugby league, it becomes a debate as to who's going to referee an international game. And it depends who has the majority view. It's usually 2-1, somebody, somebody gets down. We need to be a bit more scientific, if you like, about how we appoint uh, match officials. And I always felt that um, if you're the person in charge of putting a referee into an international game, then you're accountable for their performance. And that's how it should go. So eventually they've uh, come around to sort of that way of thinking. Um, and so basically I'll be appointing referees to international games Obviously, there's a development aspect to that in that we need to have um, a good quality of match official squad uh, to service the games that we've got and also be trying to help some of the, uh, the newer countries coming into rugby league to set up systems within their countries to bring referees forward. So hopefully the, um, we'll be looking at new referees coming from different countries, not just Australia and uh, England. Uh, hopefully we can... Uh, bring the French through, the, the Kiwis through, and even some of the other countries around the world that uh, have good systems in place, we can bring them into the international arena. So we've had people like, um, oh, thinking back, uh, Julien Rascagnier and Francois Depla from uh, France, uh, refereeing test matches between Great Britain, as it was in those days, and Australia and New Zealand, uh, whichever way around that was. Um, and then we've had you know, more recently, I suppose, than that, uh, plenty of matches where one of the nations involved is being refereed by one of his fellow um, countrymen. So is the utopian vision from all this somewhere down the line that you've kind of got a load of worldwide um, nationalities of referees that you can pick off the peg and say, yeah, Australia are playing New Zealand in a few couple of months' time, we're going to appoint you for that game. Fred Bloggs from South Africa? Well, that, that's, the, that's the hope. But, um, you know, we can't just pluck a referee out and stick him in the middle of a a major rugby league international. There has to be some development behind that. And so that's the work that we're trying to start now. Um, you know, exposure to competitions such as the Championship Super League, the NRL would be ideal, but um, obviously the people in charge of those competitions are pretty precious as to how their competition looks. So we have to find ways of pushing these people through and getting, getting them the experience. You know, we've got the European Nations Cup, the Oceania Cup now, which is showing a good standard of rugby, which is an opportunity to bring these referees through in various roles. So, um, you know, it's important that we, we spread um, the, the net of referees around the world, and touch judges as well, because one of the things that I find, especially working a lot in cricket, uh, we spend a lot of time in the south of England, and people are aware of rugby league and talk about rugby league, they're aware of my background, and the question I keep getting, oh, I watch the... Uh, you know, I watched the international yesterday. Why was an Englishman refereeing or why was an Australian referee in Australia? And it's, um, it's something the sport needs to get beyond, really. And, I mean, it's something that uh, one of your other sports, cricket, uh, had done for many years until only relatively recently in its history to say it's been, test cricket's been going so long. But you, I remember, obviously, the David uh, Constance and the Dickie Birds and the Ken Palmers standing in uh, England match, test matches for many years. And it did, and uh, it's changed now. I mean, you can probably see that the, the, the top six umpires in the world are from Australia and, and England, and yet they don't get a look in on the Ashes series. And, you know, we've, we've got DRS in, in cricket as well, which um, helps the umpires out tremendously. 
Um, and I think usually the right team wins. So, you know, it's, it's, it's got to be the right way to go. It, it gives people peace of mind uh, when there's a neutral referee involved. And I mentioned in the build-up there that um, you'd worked with Sky Television on the broadcasts, um, adding your two penneth, as it were, um, to the to broadcast from a decisions point of view. That's something that's had to go by the wayside now because of the new appointment, is it? Well, it is because you can't on one hand be uh, talking about a referee on TV and then you know, the next day phoning up and trying to do some development work with them. So it just doesn't fit. So it made sense to um, to step back. You know, my passion's always been in officiating. Um, and and as, as good as it's been to work with Sky Sports and the, the team there, um, it was something I really wanted to do. And when the opportunity came, you know, I jumped at it. You say your passion's always been in officiating. Did you ever have a pretensions to be a traffic warden, for example? Well, no. no. <laughs> I think it was, uh, it was quite weird. I mean, I, I got involved... Um, back in the 1980s, um, just through you know going through university, going into you know the world of work, suddenly sport has to take a back seat when you've got a you know you've got a career to develop and uh, family etc. Um, but I just wanted to get back involved in the sport and being around 26, 27, um, I didn't feel that actually playing again was was going to be uh, an option. So this was an expect thing, and I had an uncle who was. Uh, a touch judge who used to travel down from Cumbria at the times when I was living in Widnes, and any time he was in the Lancashire area, I would go along and watch the games. And uh, it's obviously I had access to the change news beforehand, listened to the way that the officials were talking about setting up the game and what they were looking for, and then I took that to, to the stands and actually watched them develop it. Um, my days of being brought up on rugby league in Whitehaven on the terraces, we never had a good referee up there. You know, and you, you would you would always go and uh, make sure you got your three penneth worth into the referee on his way back to the changing rooms. You know, those when you, when you watch the game as a neutral, it's a completely different game. You know, you you haven't invested in in your own team, and therefore you can you can make a better assumption as to what the referees are doing. And uh, generally, I thought the referees were doing quite well. If we can just step back from that, and we'll come back, and we've got loads to talk about in terms of your officiating career. But let us let us just rewind to what you mentioned there, and growing up in in Whitehaven, um, up there on the northwest uh, coast, a uh, little bit of an outpost, I guess, but steeped an area steeped in in rugby league. Was that always a given that you were going to be a fan? Was it something that your dad maybe took you along to to the rec to watch them play? Well, m- probably my earliest memories were of my dad going going out on Saturday afternoon. And I'd be out playing with my mates or playing football. This is around six or seven. You know, I can remember uh, him going away and coming back and talking about rugby. And uh, then one Saturday afternoon, he took me along with him and probably went every game that I was up there um, since. You know, standing on the Kells end, watching uh, some of these great players coming up from the um, from Yorkshire and Lancashire up to Whitehaven. You know, sometimes I mean, the way the competition was, everybody played everybody then. So you you you, you got to see all the stars, uh, which unfortunately doesn't happen now. Um, but it, 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 it there were just great times and um, you know great camaraderie on the terraces and you know everybody has their own place to stand and uh, things like that. It was just it was just great to grow up there. And was that something you aspired to to do then to play for Whitehaven? I think you know, like every kid, you you think about it and obviously playing through the school system. Uh, play for the district and county teams there um, but the, the education system was quite strange in a way in that at the age of 13 you were recommended to go to grammar school or you weren't and basically if you weren't recommended to go to grammar school you played rugby league and if you were you played rugby union well I went to grammar school so I was ending up playing rugby union but after a couple of years uh, we were finding that um, the the lads who were playing rugby union on Saturday were then playing rugby league on Sunday for the club sides um, so probably something that wouldn't be allowed to happen now with people playing too much rugby, but it was great. You know, I used to turn out for Kells on, on a Sunday, um, getting changed in the local pit changing rooms and uh, playing on the local pit field. It was good. We had a good side. What position did you play? I played a loose forward in rugby league and prop in rugby union. Prop in rugby union? Prop, yes. You did. You've worn pretty well to say you played prop. Yeah, I was agile. Moved around a bit. An agile prop in rugby union? Is that... That's, that's surely got to be a... Well, it is. A bit of a trades descriptions job, isn't it? We're only kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, so playing for Kells, um, 
at loose forward. You must have had pretty good ball handling skills to have been thrown in there. Yeah, I did. I don't mind. Don't mind saying, you know, <laughs> Harry Pinner. That's me. Oh, Harry Pinner. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. Or Gordon Cottier, more to the point. Okay. Ideas above his station here, folks. Uh, <laughs> Stuart Cummins. You are, uh, by the way, watching Sporting Lives with myself, Jonathan Doidge. This week's guest, Stuart Cummins. Uh, but uh, we'll regularly be looking at the life of uh, a sports person. Um, I'd like to thank Ian Holding of ICS at this point and also Julian Barnes for their assistance in helping me to put this together. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Jonathan Doidge or JD at Jonathan com if you have suggestions for any future guests. We've got some good plans for uh, more people to come over the next few weeks. So uh, back with Stuart Cummins, back on that um, theme of, of growing up around uh, Cumbria um, you mentioned the mines and, and all of that. Would you still have been around up there when the, the miners' strike and the pit closures happened in the 80s, or had you, had you fled south by then? Well, I, was, I was south. I went to uh, teacher training college in 79 down in Warrington and, you know, again, managed to find a, a, a cricket team to play for down there rather than rugby. Uh, we played rugby union at uh, college. Um, so the rugby league was sort of on the, the back burner there. I always went to look at uh, Whitehaven when they were down in the area. And as I said earlier, you know, went to visit my, uh, my uncle who was uh, running touch lines at various grounds ar- around the northwest. So I was always in touch with it, but um, it sort of took a back seat for a while. Is, is it Cumbria or is it Westmoreland to you? No, it's, it's, it was Cumberland. Cumberland, right. Cumberland, yeah, it's now Cumbria. So Westmoreland's the bottom bit by the uh, lake, bottom end of the lake Kendall, district. Right, That's okay. right, yeah. I'm glad we've sorted that one out as well. That was the 1974 boundary thing, wasn't it? That uh, it was a long time ago. That, that changed all that. So you did your, your PE teaching. You, you graduated and obviously went into PE teaching. Uh, the only school I know you were involved at was at Up Holland. That's right, Wigan, Up Holland High School. Yeah, which is why Wigan used to clearly get all the decisions when you were <laughs> referee. Oh, you're joking. Up Holland High School, uh, or Up Holland itself, is on the boundary between uh, Wigan and St Helens. So we had a, a fair mix of both sets of supporters. So when I was on a, a derby game, it was uh, it was always a decent week in school. <laughs> and and were you sort of reluctant to give that up when the refereeing started to take off a bit more for you, if you like? Or was that a fairly easy decision to make? Well, it, it, was, it was never an option to give up teaching. Um, you know, refereeing was part-time. Um, the, the salary was, was nothing like it was, um, you know, nowadays for the full-time referees. So I think I, my my first wage as a referee was I think it was forty five pounds for uh, a game, which you know was probably pretty decent in those days, but it wasn't enough to to give up a career. So you you were having to combine uh, the two really. And so when did you finish teaching? Was that when you got full time position with? Finished teaching when I was appointed as uh, head of referees yeah. in two thousand and two. So I've been teaching twenty years by the time. Uh, the, op- the, op- the opportunity came along, so to be honest, I mean, it was a, the, the prospect of another 20 years in teaching at that stage of my career or taking on something new, so it wasn't a difficult decision to make. And I mean, I remember I, at one stage, like a lot of us do who love our sport, we're passionate about it, but we know that we're not going to be good enough to, to get paid to play it. You do something you know, like this, which brings out that passion, or you maybe do. I thought about mm. PE teaching, I rem- remember, and... Um, did, were you sort of like that typical PE teacher? I can see him mind now winding his whistle around his finger and winding it back the other way. You've, and telling, been, you've been watching, have you? <laughs> <laughs> telling the young lads who were not particularly um, blessed with any ability that they were useless and more life in a junior discipline and that sort of stuff. Uh, I would never, would never do that. We always, uh, we, used, we always used to try and include everybody in, uh, in some level of, of game and uh, you know, managed to achieve it. There was, a, there was a couple of us there, male PE teachers, so we, we did okay. <laughs> what was interesting when I first started there it was a rugby union school up Holland yep. and uh, he was actually a head of year and maths teacher it was Des Seabrook who uh, used to coach the England side in the what would it be the 80s one of the coaches there and so uh, there was no way we were going to play rugby league there when I first went so we were rugby union school for probably four or five years anyway Des uh, re- retired and so we switched to playing rugby league, which uh, we played in the very strong Wigan Schools League. You know, two divisions of uh, schools. It was uh, very, very strong, even in Division 2, uh, our school started. But it was uh, a really good competition. Uh, great area to, to work in when you've got a passion f- for rugby league. So we talked about your, uh, we keep touching on your actual refereeing out there in the middle in professional sport. How did you develop 
you know, presumably you started off, I mean, I can't remember, I've, obviously, Stuart, I've tracked every game of your career, but uh, <laughs> you probably started off in a Division 2 match back in the day, something like that, did you, or a championship game, and then progressed on to your first Division or Super League stuff? Yeah, well, I think uh, my first ever Rugby League refereeing game was uh, Witness Tigers versus Blackpool Stanley under-17s <laughs> down, um, down in Widnes. Um, and from there, we then went on to Daisy Hill versus Blackpool Stanley. There was something about Blackpool Stanley early on in my career. And it's just working up through the levels. You know, obviously, um, in those days, clubs would report back, give you marks, and as usual, the, uh, the winning team gives a higher score than the losing team. But generally, the, uh, the scores do reflect the better refereeing. So I was lucky enough to get through that process and picked up and put on the, um, the the RFL's sort of register, if you like. And I, I did my exam the, the day that um, Fred Lindop was appointed as the first controller of referees. And so uh, he had a vested interest in bringing through referees, and I was lucky enough to get on, uh, on, on his, um, or in his eye line, and uh, push through the system. And within three years, I'd gone through the National League, as it was then, the... Um, the A team, and onto the uh, onto the f the first team list. So I went on there in 1991, which I was quite pleased with the progress. Uh, myself and Russell Smith did it exactly the same speed on the way through. And at the time, we were um, actually probably the youngest referees on the, on the panel. And at uh, at that time, <coughs> it would be probably 30. You know, so. Most referees were only getting through to the top level at the age of about 45, uh, sorry, 40 plus. So it was uh, it was quite different to have Russell and myself on, and we were young referees in those days. But then you know that's followed up later on by Ben Thaler being a, a, a Grade One referee at the age of 19. So things have changed drastically since then. And you need that, don't you? You need that because you're asking people to try and keep up with elite athletes these days. Yeah, well, people went into refereeing as was the case with Ruby Union up till about five years ago. They went into refereeing after they finished playing. So, you know, really we needed a lot, a lot uh, sooner than that. And uh, that, that's all changed now, certainly in Rugby League. So um, you're progressing, but I mean, we all know that all referees are rubbish, right? Um, so it's just that you're less rubbish than the other guys who were doing games that weekend. Is that how you get up the, uh, up the order? Oh, you just do things. You, you develop relationships with players. It, it, comes, it all comes through trust. And you see it now in uh, evolving cricket, but you can see the umpires who the referee, uh, the players like and enjoy working with, um, and and they'll get away with making mistakes because they they have the trust of the players, and it's the same in in refereeing. You know, everybody's going to make a, a mistake at some point. You just don't want it to be the game changing mistake, because you've got a different view to everybody else. You know, you've got a, a view through players. And everybody looks at TV cameras, a, you know, a 45 degree angle on something, and that's not the view the referee gets. Is there one? Is there a decision? Just if you can think of one, the way you uh, that you'll admit to, the way you thought, oh, you know, if only if, if there had been video referee there or something like that to check that again, because you know, on reflection, something that's been vital in a in a final, semi-final, test match, whatever. <laughs> to be honest, I mean, the video referee came in in 1996. And, my memory can't really rem remember beyond that time. There are a couple of incidents. I think probably thinking back to um, the prem one premiership final between Castleford and Wigan, um, an incident between Dean Sampson and Kelvin Skerritt where Kelvin Skerritt ended up with his jaw broken. And uh, I'm not laughing, Kelvin, no, by the way. Like that. We just didn't pick it up on the field. And when we analysed it, it was just down to our position where we used to stand over the... Uh, w it was a, a penalty kick to touch... Uh, tap restart on the 10 metres and we used to stand in line with the tap restart and as the defence was moving forward and the ball carry was moving up our position had to we had to run round the back of the defence so the point where I was going round the defensive players was the, the time when Dean Sampson hit Kelvin Skerritt to break his jaw and we missed it so you know the result of that was we changed positions on those restarts but it would have been good to actually get the perpetrator rather than him, you know, play out the rest of the game. That's one that you can think of where it didn't go as you would have liked them to on reflection. What about, is there any one game where you come off and it's been really tough out there, you know, there's been lots going on and you think, you know, you've, you've done yourself proud in the way you've handled? Well, you never, you never came off thinking you'd did yourself, you done yourself proud in, in a very difficult game because um, you come off, your head's just scrambled, you know. As, as a referee, and people probably don't appreciate this, 
you will make a decision, move on to the next one. And then, you know, if something else happens, you make a decision, you can't dwell on it, you move on to the next one. And the result of that is you go off and you can't really remember much about the game. Obviously, as you sit down and you unwind, things start to come back or you watch on the video, things will, will uh, reveal themselves. But on, in tough games, you go off and you're just exhausted. And it's difficult to, to come off and think, yeah, I did all right there. Perhaps after the review, that would happen. But the, the closest I could get to the sort of feeling you're, you're thinking about will be the 1996 Challenge Cup final between Bradford and St Helens, um, which was a fantastic game. Um, end-to-end, Robbie Paul, hat-trick, all that. It was one of those games where I just didn't need to be there and I just needed to keep up with the players and you know nudge them about uh, knock-ons and things like that. And the players just got on with it. It was a fantastic day. Uh, Red Hot and even Brian Smith came up and congratulated me after the game. So, wow, and he was on the other side. Utopia. <laughs> That's uh, fantastic. So, I mean, um, do is a good referee somebody then who isn't noticed during those eighty minutes? I would completely disagree with that. Um, you've got to do a job. If you don't do your job, the game is going to deteriorate. Um, people keep talking about the re- the referee. The good referee is the one you don't see. But what happens then is that the referee disappears into the background and doesn't step in when he needs to, and then the game starts to get ragged. So then he starts to try and pull it back um, and has to get involved more than he should. He needs to. A good referee is the one that gives the right decision at the right time. So a game with 25 penalties as opposed to a game with four, um, which, is, which has been good refereeing? Well, you'd have to see the incidents. Because if there's, I would like to think that if there's 25 penalties in a game, they're all warranted. And if they're warranted, that means that the players are at fault. But it's the referee that cops it for giving the, the right decisions. You know, if there's four, four uh, penalties, the likelihood is that there's a couple that's been missed, but did he play the advantage to the best of his ability? You know, so that could be good refereeing. It, it all depends on the circumstances. I, go, I, I YouTubed Stuart Cummins just, just to see if there was any stuff on there in terms of sendings off or incidents. And not a lot came up, actually, apart from an interview, funnily enough, with yourself and Ashley Metcalf to do with British uh, powerlifting <laughs> or weightlifting a few years ago, uh, which we'll probably touch on in, in a little while. Uh, but there was one match, funnily enough, commentated on by um, Mick Morgan. So it was a Castleford home video production. So he was doing the usual Mick speak. Mm. And you were, you were in charge, and I've forgotten the point I was uh, going to come to, uh, it'll come back to me, I'm sure. We'll carry on, we'll carry on. Well, well why not? Castleford and Wigan, for some reason, um, seemed to be the game that I, I was used to get, uh, whether it was at Wigan or whether it was at Castleford. Um, I think we had Steve Presley, Russell Smith and Ray Tennant, I think, at the time. They were all from Castleford. So there were very few referees on the top panel that could referee that game because we had uh, the Connolly brothers yep. from Wigan. So it didn't leave a lot. So that tended to be my game for some uh, for some reason. And there was always something going on. There were always close games. That's what I was going to say to you. So he was talking about, um, I think, authority and that sort of thing. I think you marched somebody 10 metres for having a chat and did the usual, you know, and off you went back. Um, and he was having a pop. Were, how would you describe yourself as a ref was what I was sort of leading up to. Um, were you an authoritative referee? Uh, were you, well, uh, if, if you if you look at that game, jovial, jocular character out there with the players? Well, I was never jovial. And, well, I suppose quietly with some of the players, you're jovial and, and jocular. But you know, don't get me wrong; these players, great players, they would take you to the cleaners if you stepped over the mark. If you tried to be too pally with one side and not the other, they would take you to the cleaners. So I tended to be fairly straight laced. There was a, a couple. I mean, Terry O'Connor was great. You know, Terry would. Uh, the mick out of you you'd do the same back and not a thing was thought about it still is the case now by the way but um i think the the game you're referring to um was one probably early 90s and so you know i've just got onto the uh, the top level of um well, the stones bit of championship so i'm refereeing the top teams for the first time in my life you know, you've got to sort of set your stall out i think by the time i'd finished in 2002 I was a lot more laid back in the way in in the approach to refereeing, and I think the re- the players responded to that too. And also, you know, when you when you've uh, done a few games, when you've done a few years, uh, the players know what to expect. And coaches and players, all they want is comfort. They want they want to know exactly what's going to happen. If they do something, what's going to happen? And so you, you get to that level where they just tend to play, which is, you know, the game you're referring to was early on in the career. You've got to set the stall out. So you probably. Um, are very 
sensitive to some of the things that are, are said and you're trying to stamp your authority a bit. Typical school teacher, I think he said. Ah, typical school That's teacher, it. I'm in charge. Well, I can't, I can't get away from that. I was a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what do you think then to, um, I mean, if you think back about the, uh, the relatively recent history, like, let's say the last 40 years, 50 years or whatever, of rugby league refereeing, I remember standing on the terraces before working in the media covering games, the, the Robin Whitfields. Um, I've, I've heard the stories about Eric Clay. I have never I didn't actually see him referee a game, just a little bit too young for that, but they called him the Sergeant Major. Uh, I remember Robin Whitfield from standing on the terraces at Headingley running on with the ball in his hand across to the south stand, waving it at them um, and before he went back to the uh, centre spot and called the captains over for the toss-up. Um, people so you, like John... You think, you think he was waving the ball at them, do you? <laughs> How was he holding the ball? <laughs> and he was sort of on a... Uh, <laughs> brilliant. Right, you see, that's fantastic, um, giving them the sign. And then John Holdsworth, um, and you talked about, funnily enough, um, about the referee's earnings. I remember we used to work in finance, and John was one of the customers at um, a building society I worked at in Central Leeds back in the days when he was refereeing, so I saw the checks back then. I think you were. Uh, I think you were doing yourself down. Um, but John used to be out there in the middle, and I, I used to love John's, uh, ex, you know, expressive mm. style because he had this way of pointing at both the touch judges after a try had been scored and giving them this sort of signal, right. very, very clear mm. and definite. And when we did uh, tapping on the the lips for a back chat and that sort of thing, and his very definite penalty signs. So that we had sort of character referees somehow, didn't we? What are your thoughts on, on that? Should that be the case? Did you ever fancy going out there and, and entertaining the crowd rather than just refereeing the game? Well, I, it felt like it. Certainly coming off the comments I was getting, I was entertaining the crowd anyway. So, <laughs> But no, it, the, the whole thing's changed. I mean, people talk to me, oh, Sergeant, Ed, where, you know, where are the likes of Sergeant Major Eric Clay? Well, I've seen a couple of games where he's awarding tries from the centre line. You know, So <laughs> you, you wouldn't get away with that. Um, Robin Whitfield was one of the blokes that uh, was that I spoke a lot to when I was starting off refereeing. Spent a lot of time around his house, looking at videos, listening to the way he talks. I mean, he was he was the you know for me he was probably the best referee um, that we'd had. Um, and he'd been a player. He knew what the players wanted. He knew how to talk to the players. He knew the manner in which you had to go about your refereeing. And that you know I tried to copy that, and it was pretty successful for me. Um, however, he was. He was refereeing along with John um, and the others you've mentioned. He was refereeing in an era where there were probably only five cameras in the ground. Uh, they, weren't, they didn't have a microphone on them. Um, and so we had to adapt to a microphone being on us. I think the mic we started wearing a microphone that went out live to air um, in about 94. And we had to massively change the way we spoke because you couldn't have banter on the, on the run. You know, the players had to be aware that there's a microphone on there. It completely changed the way we were. And uh, whether that's for the better, I don't know. But um, it, it, it is difficult to make a quick point to a player and, and also use the Queen's English as well. <laughs> and because it isn't, it isn't just refereeing as in the, the, the black and white, as it were, of, uh, of making a decision and making the right decision. Yes, that's, that's obviously what we, want, we all want to see. Um, but it's they call it game management these days, don't they? They have game management from a player perspective, but also from from the officials' perspective. It is. Well, you hear all you hear stories. I mean, I've spent quite a few, t uh, quite a bit of time with Mike Stevenson, Stevo, and he would tell stories of what went on in the scrum, and referees would see it and said, "Hey, I saw that. You've got one goal back at him, and that's it, finished." And they sort of got on with that, but you could never do that nowadays. You, can, can you imagine? You know, you'd seen something, but you didn't penalise it. You know, the, the, everyone would be, be up in arms. So it, it's, it's just a, a different era now. We have to, we have to go with the scrutiny and, uh, it, you know, adapt to it. Not only that, but, I mean, when you think about the amount of cameras that are on games and the fact that things go viral on social media within seconds, if, if you let something like that go, it, it's just not going to be a great for the image of the sport, is it? No, it's not. And not only the cameras in the ground, we've got everybody with a smartphone. And there'll be somebody, you know, on the, the side of the terraces who's actually filming at the time that picks up something that goes on and that's out on the, you know, that's, that's gone viral in, in no time. So there's a lot of, you've got to cover your back in a, a lot of respects, which, which is a shame, but it does narrow the way you can manage the game. We all know you were the best referee that's ever walked on a field. I mean, we don't have any rubbish on Sporting Live, so the, the only reason you were going to be invited in was because you were the best of all time. So, but taking yourself out of the equation and seriously, who's the best you've seen? Who's the best you've worked with? Uh, I would say Bill Harrigan. 
And for what reason? <laughs> He's just a, a great manager, uh, superb athlete, which I wasn't. Um, and you know, he, he knew exactly what the game needed. You know, he had a bit about him. He, he you know, he uh, he thought he, he actually thought he was the best as well. And uh, you know, that showed. But he he was he was just a great a great uh, referee and a great bloke. Uh, and what about of, of the Brits? Of the Brits, probably I would say Robin Whitfield. Uh, you know, he he was my mentor, the the, the person that I was listening to and uh, tried to to be like. Um, and I don't think there's been many better managing the game than him. I notice you've not mentioned any of your contemporaries or those of you've worked with then as a performance manager, uh, the likes of um, Russell Smith, Ashley Klein, um, and and many more. Uh, you mentioned Ben Thaler earlier on. So um, is that is the is it competitive when you're refereeing? Do people not want to give other people credit? Oh, it's very competitive. I know I was um, Russell. Russell and I were were vying with each, with each other for virtually every major appointment during the um, what was it the the nineties, uh, so, really. So do you go back to a match? Uh, let's say Russell refereed, uh, you know, Wigan against Saints Derby last Friday night. Are you looking at that video as well? Going, well, they got that wrong. Well, got absolutely, that wrong. absolutely. <laughs> In fact, one of the things Fred Lindop saying, Fred, by the way, did you see that match on Friday? Yeah, well, one of the things I used to say to the touch judges, is, um, you know, and we, it was, it was mainly the same guys, Tony Martin, um, etc., who were on the um, the sideline for me when we coming through. Tony Brown, um, amongst others, and I used to say to them, uh, look, there's uh, there's probably eighty five percent of the referee fraternity waiting for us to stuff up tonight because that's that's the way it was. Everybody thinks that their way to get up is actually for somebody else to stuff up instead of looking to do the hard work and get up there and, and do it yourself. So there was always that. Um, but I tended to look at it a slightly different. When Russell got a final um, in front of me, I'd start looking at a couple of his games and see what he was doing better than me at the time. And you have to be honest enough to, to admit, yeah, he's going well, so I've got to improve in, in different areas. And that's the, the sort of way I pushed up and actually took that view into um, when, when, I, when I took over the role as head of referees in 2002, which was a bit of a bit of a change to some of the referees who just wanted to turn up, referee the game, go back and turn up again the next week. So winding it on to becoming the um, uh, RFL match officials director um, at the end of your career in the middle, um, was that is that then a harmonious environment? You know, leading on from what you've just been saying about the competition you felt when you were actually out there in the middle. It, is it a harmonious environment to work in? You, uh, no. Body language suggests that may not be the case. Well, yeah. it was very difficult. It, it was, it was, I would say, awkward more than anything else at first because, you know, there was a lot going on behind the scenes at the RFL at the time. I think uh, Super League and uh, the Rugby League were trying to come together, which is quite ironic considering where they are now. Um, they were trying to bring the whole game together. Richard Lewis had just been appointed. There was um, a panel, I can't remember the, the title of the panel, that were uh, bringing all this together. I was approached to get at a game and uh, asked to do this role. And so I had uh, to think about it for a while, turned it down, and they kept on coming back. After about three approaches, made me an offer. And one of the people in charge, I won't mention his name, he, he said to me, look, Stuart, if your colleagues find out that you were offered the, the job and whoever gets the job finds out you were offered the job, your career is going to be ended anyway. So you might as well take the job. So, well, fair enough. <laughs> I better, better get on with it. So we, um, I, got, I went into the job and obviously everything had to be hush-hush until it was announced. And I think some of the lads that uh, I'd obviously been working with for a few weeks felt that um, I should have told them, I should have... Uh, said what was going on, but, you know, your hands are tied. So it was, that was awkward for a while. And then um, we had Russell Smith departed to Australia. He just uh, phoned me up a couple of weeks before he went, before the start of the season, said, uh, I'm off, but I might be back. I want to try this out. So, again, not a lot you could do. It was a part-time environment. Uh, <clears throat> nobody had any contracts to, to keep him there. So off he went. So we were trying to build things up around that. And it probably took about three or four years to get the squad to up to a level where uh, Andy needed them to be, you know, with some new blood coming in. So I think they were pretty good. And then following on from that, we uh, made the decision to put the full-time squad into into being. And, of course, there's no manual to get it all together. So you, you're sort of trying to build things that you think are needed. And, again, it probably took us about three uh, three years to get to where we needed to be. Um, 
did you? I'll let you, um, I'll let you take a drink for a moment. Uh, by the way, folks, you are watching Sporting Lives with myself, Jonathan Deutsch, <coughs> my guest this week, Stuart Cummings. Um, thanks again to Ian Holding of Independent Content Services and to Julian Barnes for um, assisting with uh, putting this together. He said, trying to find the right camera. Uh, you can get in touch with me, jd at jonathandoidge.com to make suggestions for guests who you'd like to see on future uh, Sporting Lives podcasts. And uh, you can also follow me on Twitter to get the latest in terms of uh, when the next one is going to be out. It's at Jonathan Doidge. So hopefully uh, Stuart's feeling okay to talk again now. Um, um, match officials uh, director at one stage for the RFL. Um, and we've just been talking about whether that was a, a harmonious um, environment to to work in. Do you feel th that you were supported by the governing body in what you were trying to achieve? And did you did you improve? Do you feel you improved the standard of refereeing when you were in that position? Oh, I think we we had, we, we made massive strides forward. <laughs> I just think that uh, people are a bit short sighted in the way they look at things. You know the. The way that referees now approach the game, the way they train for the game, the way they review the game, was far superior to anything that was uh, that we did as as referees, and that has to be a good thing. You know, the uh, the, the clubs are spending a lot of money on analysis and um, performance, and it's only right that the RFL do the same thing. I think there was a lot of support, generally, from um, the hierarchy at the RFL. But it, it seemed to be that they were under pressure from a lot of clubs as well, that they would go directly to the CEO of a referee's decision, which, you know, is nonsense, really. There has to be systems for, for people to go through, and they weren't always followed. Did you still fancy, you know, donning the shirt and getting out there in one of these big games while you were sort of overseeing things? Uh, not while I'm overseeing it, no. I'd rather put somebody else out there. But there have been times, certainly commentating uh, with Sky, because um, yeah, when, when, you, when you're in the job, you... You don't always see the build-up to things. When I was working with Sky at grand finals and semi-finals, you, you're sort of uh, seeing all the build-up to it and you can feel the, the same sort of feelings building up inside you that you want to get involved and be out there with them. So, you know, for me, certainly with the Sky and uh, the, the work I was doing there, I was hooked up to all the officials. I could hear everything that was going on and that was pretty good. Uh, so when you were, uh, when you were out there... and when doing the big games as a ref yourself were you a nervous sort of character before matches were you pacing up and down were you or were you fairly um you know keeping it all uh, well within if you like and and what was out of all those massive games that you did which which would give you the most pride which was the the biggest goosebump moment for you i don't know about goosebumps but um i was i was sort of um sort of pretty laid back in that i knew the level that i had to get myself to Obviously, early early on in your career, you, you're nervous about every game, but you learn how to handle that. But getting towards the back ends and the, the big games, I think the first Wembley final was the, the Bradford Saints uh, match I mentioned before in 96. But I'd already refereed the World Cup final then. So that was in 95. So I got used to Wembley, and I knew the, the place, and I knew what I needed to do. So I would, I would just go and get in my kit about two hours before the game and just sit in the changing rooms, listen to some music, wander out now and again, look at what was going on. I really felt happy in that place. So I was pretty laid back in the big games, and same at Old Trafford. It was pretty good that you do a couple of reserved referee appointments there before you actually get, got to referee the game. So you got to know the stadium, you got to know what was happening on those events, so nothing came as a surprise. So, you know, I, I would be fairly relaxed about them and really enjoyed them. Um, as I got later in my career, I was looking for challenges within the game, so if the, if the pressure built up in the game, I was actually enjoying that, and sometimes hoping that it would uh, something would flare up to uh, break out of the mundane. So I was always looking for challenges within the game. So I never really got nervous. Uh, do you? Was it better refereeing in your era than maybe it is it is now, or or maybe than it was pre your era back in the days, as you alluded to, where you know refs allowed players to to have one, you know themselves in the bank to uh, to go back and whack their um, <laughs> retaliate yeah. on their opponent who got one in first yeah I think it was pretty good uh, in our era where where we ended up um, I always people would think that the referee would um, see the big screen in the corner as a threat well I always thought that it's a, a pretty good thing because most people are making a, an assumption on a decision I make from 90 meters away at least by putting it on the screen more often than not and probably 95% of the time I would be right on what I was giving. So hopefully that would uh, give them some comfort to the crowd. Not that it ever did, 
but uh, you know it, it, it brings some clarity to a decision did you i mean there's rules sort of on tries for forward passes for example that you couldn't use the big screen did you ever sneakily have a look across at the, the far corner there and uh, while you're still waiting for to make the call there and go yeah that's a no, try uh, well you never you never have time within the game after a try you know when they uh, the wet the lining up the conversion you you would often look and uh, you know there's been a couple of occasions where you hear a big groan from the crowd and you think oh <laughs> what's gone on there so you know you have a look there and then you just have to get on with it no matter what's put up there if you haven't used the uh, video referee then you've just got to move on from that point how did you feel about wearing pink i never wore pink <laughs> <laughs> I was the one that brought pink in. Oh, right. You, you, so you moved on, but brought no. pink in for the time you the, moved on. The pink was brought in for the 2008 World Cup. And the reason it was brought in was that um, they just wanted to have one referee shirt. And so when they got all the colours of the other teams, they saw pink as the only option. So following on from that in 2013, we made a slight adjustment and we had pink and blue stripes, which actually worked quite well. So... <laughs> That's how the pink's come in. It's just a neutral colour. OK. Well, it, I suppose we accept it these days, like we do players wearing flash-coloured boots that would have been ridiculed at first when they first came in. So you refereed the 95 World Cup final. I was there as a paying spectator back then. Um, so it was your fault that... Um, well, apparently for two years I was blamed for that. <laughs> for not um, sending an Aussie player off for tripping Tony Smith, I think it was. Oh, yeah, on yeah. a break. I knew there was something that I could blame you for. Which uh, wasn't a trip. I can't actually remember the score of the final. that year. I remember vividly the 1990 Test win there and the 92 World Cup final. 95 final? You're looking at me as if I'm going to tell you. Yeah. And I can't remember. I just know Australia, Australia won. Yeah, I think again, it was close. Fair, close, was it? Yeah. Right. Um, I should know that, but uh, it's, it's gone into the dim and distant past now. So which other World Cup final was it, 2000? 2000, 2000 yeah. Australia, New Zealand at Old Trafford. Yeah. It was a fairly easy win for Australia, that one. And I was broadcasting on that by then, and remember that well. It was a, it was just a tournament that was wrecked by the weather, Rain. wasn't it? Yeah, we went, Rain. I remember going everywhere and just getting drenched in front of low crowds. I think yeah, it was, I did a game at Watford. Which it's always it's always quite exciting going to a, a ground you've not been to. Went to Watford, and it rained for about two days before, and I was actually amazed that the pitch was in such good condition. But it just absolutely threw it down all the way through the game, and uh, it, it just wasn't a great spectacle for the sport, which you know should have been live on Saturday afternoon TV. It just wasn't great. Yeah, I was there for that as well. It was Australia against uh, one of the Samoa or yeah, like one of the that, islands. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, Fiji, Cook Island, something like that. Mm. Yeah, I would like to be one of these people that could pinpoint every decision in every game and tell you the scores and this, that and the other. But I think we need Ian Proctor for that. Yeah, great great man for that sort of thing uh, with his stats. OK, so um, I think we've covered rugby league pretty well or your involvement with it. Uh, British weightlifting that comes out of sort of left field. How did that involvement come about well, when, and how long were you involved? When, um, when I left the RFL... Uh, one of the things I was keen to do was to um, try and set up my own consultancy working with different sports because um, at the RFL we're quite lucky in that we've got you know a bit of public funding, uh, got a full-time system set up, but there's a lot of sports who are working part-time with their officials who don't have the structures that, um, that we had. So I was quite keen to try and work with some of those, uh, help them with the systems, and that's how the British weightlifting came about. Ashley was the... Um, CEO just being appointed as the CEO and he needs somebody to do some work and uh, he phoned me up and asked me if I'd come and have a look at a couple of things for him and it just sort of bloomed from there I, I, I think I started off as um, to look at some qualifications which I hadn't done before so I was quite keen to to look into that and, and work through those so we set up the level one and two weightlifting qualifications um, and and from there it went on to being doing a lot of development work with him so I was basically there for 12 months, but at the same time, um, it wasn't a full-time role. I was doing work elsewhere. I was doing some work with Sky, obviously, and I was also doing some work with uh, the International Netball Federation and the ECB, um, working with their umpires and trying to, uh, you know, working as an umpire mentor there at, at that time. Um, and so, but weightlifting, you don't need an umpire, do you? It, what, well, well, there are what with that? There are officials there, you know, and that's another thing we were looking at, the, the officials' qualification. 
But um, you know, it 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 taught me a lot. You know, it, it wasn't a sport I knew, and it, it's it's quite good to get into a new challenging situation. You know, so they, they certainly work very hard in that sport, and they don't get a lot of the um, credibility that they probably need. So if they don't lift it right correctly, do you march them back ten meters? No, no. So lift it from there. <laughs> have to do it again. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's not really a sport I know much about. I remember sort of sport encyclopedias as a child with seeing pictures of uh, Vasily Alexeyev, the Russian weightlifter yeah. of the 70s. Yeah. He must have won in uh, Mos uh, Munich or Moscow or something like that. And it, you, you just sort of thought big fat blokes lifting bars that bent oh, well. because the weights on the end were so massive. But actually, I mean, watching that little video the other day, uh, you know, women lifting weights these days and the athleticism of these people well, is it, tremendous. The interesting thing that uh, at, at the time that I was there, they're, they're obviously looking for uh, Sport England funding for their, um, or uh, UK sport funding, for their uh, elite athletes to compete in the Olympics, Commonwealth Games. And uh, the interesting thing there was that the men's funding at that time was pulled because they didn't think they had any that could compete. And yet there was funding for seven seven women who, you know, when I stand next to them, they come up to sort of my chest. They are so small, and yet they're lifting more, a lot more than my body weight. You know, they, they, were, they were really fantastic athletes, and to watch them. So, you know, it was, it was good fun. It was a good time. And like I say, it's a good challenge to go into things that you're, uh, you're not comfortable in and uh, work through it. I noticed, by the way, that when whoever it was who interviewed you asked you if you'd uh, been up for the challenge of lifting that weight, you, you categorically said no. <laughs> Listen, the bar's heavy enough on those things without the, the things on the end. <laughs> um, so let's move on to cricket because uh, that's something that, again, has um, clearly been a, a source of interest and something that you've played to a good standard as well. Uh, was that something you played growing up in, in, in Cumbria? Yeah, I mean, uh, cricket and rugby... Was, uh, was was all I was about as a kid, you know, not a great deal more to do in Whitehaven. But we had a good cricket club, we had um, good amateur rugby league clubs, and so so that was it. You know, once the rugby season had finished, we were down at the cricket club uh, playing down there. And also, like I said, I went to a grammar school, it was either you played rugby and you played cricket. If you wanted to play anything else, then you didn't get to do it. And for those of us who love our rugby league and our cricket, you know, Maurice Lindsay and Vic Wakelin at Sky have got a lot to answer for when they, <laughs> they moved rugby league lock, stock and barrel to the summer back yeah. in 1996. Um, and so for the last 20 odd years, it's been, it's been tough trying to combine those two loves from a, a broadcasting perspective, mm. as you know, and also just from a, a daily working perspective, if you happen to be working in both sports. Um, Cheshire, how did that come about? Obviously, you've moved down to that area and I noticed you played a few games, minor counties cricket for Cheshire. Yeah, well, uh, I, I played through the, the county system up in, uh, up in Cumbria, so Cumbria schools up to under-19s level, and um, I went down, at the age of 18, I went to teacher training college, but still played for Whitehaven in the first two years I came back, and during that time I was playing for Cumberland second team um, in their development squad. Um, then the third year um, at college, at Warrington. Warrington asked me to go and play for them. Well, it meant that I could play more cricket because uh, I could only really play the second half of the season. So I went down playing for them. And uh, you know, as it is, they were short of a player uh, for a second team game. So I then got in their system um, at that time. And then I think it was 87, 86 and 87, I played for Cheshire for two seasons. But again, it's trying to combine minor counties cricket with, with teaching. You have to take unpaid leave, which doesn't pay the mortgage, and it, it does result in quite a lot of time off uh, off school. So, after two years, um, decided it probably wasn't going to be uh, working for me to continue playing for Cheshire, which is actually when I started uh, refereeing. I was looking for another challenge, so I went on to that. Okay, but um, you know, I played two seasons for Cheshire, which uh, which was pretty good. Like you say, high standard of um, of of play, and played with some interesting characters. Going to say, tell us more about that. I mean, did, did you play with uh, some people whose names we might know who were on the way down, if you like, from county cricket, and some who were on the way up? Well, some of them, the deals? some of them have finished the county uh, county careers. Ian Cobain yep. uh, from Lancashire, uh, he was the the captain for the second year. Uh, we had Barry Wood uh, playing <laughs> as our um, our professional, and I remember my first um, second team game uh, for Cheshire was a game at um, in, in North Wales. It was a Cheshire second team versus North Wales cricket um, eleven, 
uh, early on in the season. And Chester Bolton Hall had, uh, were renowned for bringing over West Indian um, overseas players. And you could have an overseas players in the minor counties. So I was a wicket keeper. We batted first and West Indian guy is opening the ball in from the, the far end. Never seen him bowl. And in those days, not like now, you have to go out and warm up for 45 or an hour and a half before the game. You just turned up and you did your job. Um, so one of the guys in the slips was uh, in the Liverpool competition. I said, what's he like, this guy? He said, oh, I've not seen him, but I've heard he's, uh, he's pretty sharp. So I'm saying, what do you reckon about here? He said, oh, yeah, I should do. Anyway, the first ball came through and it nearly pinned me to the side screen. Only turns out it's Kirtley Ambrose is the bloke's name. <laughs> So he, he was there as well. And also in the Cheshire first team, Madassa Nazar, he, yeah. uh, he played for, for a while. So there was, there was plenty of people around and it was a good standard of cricket. Sounds like it. Uh, Madassa Nazar, famous test match at Lords in 82, mm. I think it was, wasn't it? Um, mm. Had a, a great game, man of the match. Uh, Kirtley Ambrose, one of the legends of, uh, yeah. of fast bowling. And Barry Wood well, was a very, very good player, played Plenty of test matches, couldn't tell you exactly how many, but it was just all in and out of the side like many players were in those days, wasn't yeah, it? But, uh, yeah. Diminutive, but uh, plenty of ability. I remember him bowling little sort of dibbly doblies oh, as well did. as his he did. He just did the little away swingers that yeah. just nip back now and again. So caused me all sorts of problems, he did. And were they sort of the sort of characters that told... I mean, I can't imagine Curtly Ambrose telling you lots of funny stories about uh, things going on in his career. It didn't strike me as being that sort of a character, but maybe wrong. Barry Wood, probably. No. Uh, well, Curly, he was patois. That's what he just spoke patois, so it was yeah. difficult to understand. But Barry Wood would uh, he, he certainly let you know what he thought. And, uh, yeah, he had some good stories, but Ian Corbyn was the one with all the stories. OK. Um, there were, obviously, you know, good times for a couple of years by the sound of things, and that, that love for cricket then re-manifested itself a little bit um, more well, recently with the cricket layer than officer job. Yeah, well, I continued playing cricket uh, for Warrington um, when I could. But obviously, as you mentioned earlier, once they switched to the summer, um, I tried to continue playing cricket, but it just, you know, you just couldn't um, guarantee when you were going to be available. And I've, I've always believed that if you're going to do something, you do it properly. Uh, you don't just turn up and uh, take somebody else's place when you, you feel like it. So the cricket had to go, uh, concentrated on the refereeing, and then when in 2013, when I finished the RFL, I'd known Chris Kelly, who was in charge of the umpires at, uh, at Lords. Um, he got in touch and said, would you, would you mind coming doing some mentoring with the umpires? I want to get a different perspective rather than just the um, ex-umpires looking at the, the umpires. So I went to do some work with them and it worked out quite well. Then they changed the role from umpire and mentoring to um, cricket liaison officer, it's called. It's basically a match referee role. But they didn't want to go, because they couldn't guarantee coverage right across the game, they didn't want to call it match referee. From next year, it's going to be called match referee. So uh, that's really how I dropped into that role. But it's, it's all, what's given me, given me credibility is not only the, um, the level of refereeing I, I, I've been at, but also the minor counties uh, playing earlier on in my career. So it's, a, it's certainly a case of you never know what's going to be useful later on in your life. So... Never yeah. burn your bridges. And we have uh, bumped into each other in the middle. Uh, never bumped into you in the middle when you were a rugby league referee, but since you've been doing this job um, with my um, treks around county cricket, match referees in, in cricket terms, by comparison to rugby league, similarities, differences? Oh, completely different in that the, the match referee in uh, cricket is basically overseeing uh, what's happening. Um, the report on the umpire's performance... The report on the state of the pitch, uh, the report uh, on captain's feedback, and also deal with any disciplinary issues that occur during the game. They're dealt with on the spot, and uh, it works pretty well. How much, in terms of, if you like, feedback, as you might positively call it, or complaints, um, do, do you get doing that role from the two counties involved in a cricket match, for example? Uh, again, compared to the two clubs you would have been involved in as a rugby league referee or match officials manager, yeah, it's chalk and cheese. Um, I, I think the difference is that you know, you know, if you're on a, a four-day game, there's plenty of time to talk about things and, and talk things through. So um, by the time you get to the end of the game, any issues that have cropped up, you sort of talked about them, and you, you can talk uh, with the captains or the coaches again in a, a pretty calm manner. I think in rugby league, you, you know, the, um, the, the, the 80 minutes you've got often leaves coaches, captains in a, a rare state if there's a defeat on a, the end of a decision 
um, at some point during the game. So it tends to blow off. You don't have the, the same sort of time to, to talk things through. Everything's in a nutshell. And of course, the press want to get to the coaches. So the coaches are mentioning things on there and so it escalates. Do you, do you know that's going to blow up then? If, if uh, I, don't, I won't mention any names, but a rugby league coach, they've come out on the wrong end of a game. So actually, some coaches um, do, uh, do that reverse psychology. They've won the game and they will then use that as the forum to criticise yeah, yeah. the referee, won't they? Yeah. Uh, do, do you know, do you listen to the press conferences at all and expect to, to get that, um, that no, ramp because... down the phone or...? Because if, if the game's live, if I'm at the game live, or if if I'm you know watching the game on TV when I'm in charge of the referees, I know I know what the issues are going to be. I know what they're going to phone up about. Um, and most of the coaches were pretty good. You know, they'd make the point, and that would be it. There were a few that you know would really go over the top, and uh, you just think, well, you need to look at your own performance a bit more than you start blaming here. And that's a lot of what it was about. You know, if they can uh, certainly, when when if, if a coach goes to the press, he's making a point. And Tony Bar- Barrow uh, was coached at Oldham at Warrington um, when I was starting off in my career, and he would always have a go at me. And I remember one game he'd been in between jobs, uh, Warrington and at Halifax. Uh, he was doing some commentary work for BBC GMR, and uh, he'd been appointed to the Halifax game, the the week that I was refereeing there. So I turned up on the uh, Sunday. He wasn't coaching the side. He was going to start the, the week after. And I saw him in the boardroom after the game, which, you know, another big change. The referees went in the boardroom. You learned how to handle yourself in there. So I went in the boardroom and Tony was there. And he says, well done, Mr Cummins. He said, uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be on your back next week. I said, oh, it won't be the same. Not hearing your dulcet tones on the radio, Tony. He said, don't you worry. He said, you'll hear my dulcet tones when you're refereeing because if I can make these lot think, and he points to his board members, if I can make these lot think it's your fault, he says, I stay in a job. <laughs> and that was early on in my career, and it's stuck with me ever since, even in the role as uh, head of referees. You know, you, you, you see where they're coming from. Sometimes, you know, the, the complaint is, is legitimate, but a lot of it's uh, making a lot of noise so that it, you know, it takes the, the blame away from the players and puts it somewhere else. And does that then tend to usually be from coaches who are under pressure, they're on a string of defeats, yeah. they might be staring relegation down the face or whatever? It is. It, it tends to be that. And I understand that. Um, but probably a better way, there's a better way to, to work that stuff out. Interesting. Um, so back, back with the cricket um, match refereeing, or liaison, however we're going to... When you said... It's match refereeing or match referee from next year. Do you mean this, this season, this, this season, twenty twenty yeah. season? Yeah. Uh, so, does is that going to change anything by having, is that, or is that just because of the fact that they can now have a match referee at every county game? Well, I, I just think it brings in line it into line with other countries and the ICC. In that there's a structure there. You know, the, the ICC match referee. We have the ECB cricket liaison officer. Uh, it, it now just makes it easier for everyone to understand what the role is. And you sort of, uh, you know, sit there, people bringing you coffees and food all day. I it's wish. A, it's a free <laughs> lunch, really, isn't it? Uh, watching videos of, of what's going on out there in the middle. And you get the, with technology these days, you get the opportunity, I, I assume, to, to review any decision that's given within seconds yeah. and, th- and know then do, if... if uh, James Middlebrook, sorry, sorry, Middy, uh, but you know, if uh, if an umpire makes a couple of howlers in the morning session, are you straight in there at lunch, having a chat with with whoever it might be? Obviously not you, Middy, um, but somebody else. Um, but you know, if if that well, happens, are you, do you do that, or do you wait till the end of the day and let them just concentrate on what's still to come because that might affect their performance then in the next two sessions that day? No, well, we, we're collecting clips all throughout the day. Right. It's not my role to go and tell the umpire what he should have done or what he needs to do. If Midders comes to me at lunchtime and said, can I have a look at that uh, decision? I'll put it up for him. But I won't make a comment on it, you know, because that's not my job. Um, Chris Kelly has people who look at decisions. I'm right. looking at the body language, the yep. way they manage the, um, they manage the game and how they are with the players. Um, body language? So, well, yeah, yeah. So, it's, well, it's key. It's key. So, so if you give a decision and you're laughing... Then that's a no-no. Well, that's that's an extreme example, shall we say? <laughs> it's more more to the point where they're they're under pressure. How are they responding to the pressure they're being put in? 
Um, you know, you see a lot of appeals, sometimes crazy appeals, put on newer umpires, such as Midders, is good. He can cope with it. But, um, you know, a lot of decisions are put on new umpires. So you're looking to see how they respond. You're looking to see, well, any umpire, how they're responding to being under pressure. You know, does the body language change? You want them to look calm all the time. You don't want to see any difference. You know, uh, giving somebody out, do they start to move and then think no? You know, because they need to change that. Uh, it's just little things that uh, are triggers for players to, to get into the umpire. So what about such as Rudy Kurtzen, famously when he did the long draw of the finger, but sometimes he'd move his hand and it looked like he might be doing that and then put it back in his pocket? Yeah, well, you have the, uh, the umpires who change uh, coins from the hand, that they, they, the dismissal hand, into the other one. So he sort of comes halfway up, exchanges the coin and goes back down. So, you know, stuff like that it doesn't, uh, doesn't assist the players. I know on international cricket broadcasts or televised broadcasts that there is the benefit of the stump mic. Is there any technology out there in the middle no. that you can hear any? So um, there is there is on um, on televised games, um, but generally county championship games, there's no technology in the middle. Right. So if there is a little bit of a you know mumble and grumble from a bowler at an umpire, a non-decision or whatever the decision is not given for him, you you're only relying on the hearsay of the two characters involved or those. Well, the umpire, in that case, the umpire will come in and report the play, right. and that will come to me at the end of the day. And then we'd, we'd hold a meeting with the umpires and the captain and player and decide whether that's made out. What's the toughest action you've had to take with anybody since you've been doing it? A level one, a level one sanction, which is the, the lightest sanction, a descent. Um, you know, a batsman looking at his bat after he's been given out LBW or something like that. Um, haven't got any further than a level one yet. I, I always used to look at my bat after I've been giving out LB. It's a lovely bat, you know. <laughs> that's all I'm doing. I'm, yeah, know. we'll do it in the changing rooms. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so so body language, not only from the umpire's perspective, but from the player's perspective, is key as well in terms of how they accept decisions. Yeah, I mean, dissent, dissent the ECB are quite strict on dissent, um, and they don't really have a, you know, a great deal of... Uh, of leeway on that you know they, they, if they're given out by the umpire they're expected to walk off even if they're disappointed you know they, they need to move away there are uh, things in place where they can make the point known um, but they don't want to see dissent on the field Do you get loads of moans and groans from from coaches and that sort of thing uh, well again not really because you know I'm out on the field at 9 yeah. o'clock in the morning the game starts at 11 I'm around there with the coaches the coaches will have a word with you if they've got an issue. That, you know, they would have have a, a, a word in, in the correct way. You know, they come and discuss things. I would never put it down as moans and groans. There's been a couple of occasions where uh, something's happened at the end of the game, and uh, you know, people have come in. Um, but I would rather they did that and come and talk to me, calm down, and then go and talk to the press or talk to you guys. I know you'd like it the other way around. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I've played in a game uh, where a player. Um, we, this, you're probably never going to get this in county cricket, but um, a club match where a player, they offered a substitute to our team as a fielder because one of our players got injured in the field and then he ended up catching out one of, the, one of his teammates, just happened to be in the wrong position, if you like, and the teammate ran at him past the bowler while the ball was still in the air and he was standing underneath it to catch it, saying, if you catch that ball, I will not be happy, shall we say. Mm. Um, throwing his bat on the floor at him and all that. Something like that, or a Michael Holden kicking the three stumps out of the ground like he did famously in a test match. What what sort of level of referral is that then, and discipline decision? Um, well, the first one would probably be a level two, serious dissent, and the second one would be uh, a level one, could be possibly a level two, really? depending on the uh, ver you know how harsh it is or how, how strong it is. So you can flatten the stumps, lads, and you're probably going to get it. Level one. So level two, serious descent. What, what's the net, what's level three? Is that um, well, level three. Punching the umpire. Or yeah, something? level three gets to some sort of physical contact, and level four goes to assault, and level that's four. that's that's a red card. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. So red cards and yellow. Do yellow well, cards. Well, they call it red card. It's sent off basically. They don't exist. No. But you can also you, you can be dismissed temporarily, in cricket. Well, was it successful, by the way, as a keeper? Did you take loads of victims? Did you, were you, yeah, I did were you the Alan Knot of Cheshire? Yeah, I did okay, yeah, did Back okay. You know, got by. 
Average of 47 on two years on the run. Um, well, obviously, uh, any club out there at the moment that uh, wants oh, to listen, sign... Um, my last game, we had a reunion game about 10 years ago at Cheshire. I went into bat, edged it, first ball, out, kit's gone. That's it. <laughs> the kit has gone. I think mine's still stuck in the, the, the attic, just in case, you know, just, just you need, for old time's yeah, sake. You need a first baller just to realise... Your eyes aren't what they used to be. Your reactions aren't what they used to be. <laughs> well, it's been great talk, talking. Where, where do we leave this then, Stuart? What, what's the future um, for Stuart Cummins? Um, uh, getting towards, how can we put it, the, the golden years Retirement. of working life? <laughs> yeah. Retirement, yeah. Well, still a mortgage to pay off, so once that's done, I think uh, that'll, be, that'll be me. But I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying what I'm doing, you see. Um, you know, I get a couple of months off in the year um, after working pretty hard through the summers. Um, you get a couple of months off that rejuvenates things and gets you out there again. Um, but I'm working for two organisations now, uh, the ECB, fantastic organisation to work with. I'm um, going to some great places around the country, um, you know, sitting in first-class facilities watching first-class cricket. Can't doesn't get much better for me, that. Um, and then the international job came up, uh, which I've been passionate about, the International Rugby League and the way that the officials... Um, dealt with in that so that gives me an opportunity to shape things over the next uh, sort of five years and when you do finally uh, put the feet up for the last time are you still going to be present at Sporting Stadia following your passions as a fan of the game or are you going to be a TV viewer I may well be I may well be a Yorkshire member turning up at Yorkshire. nine o'clock in the morning open the paper and sit there till six o'clock at night and get in the last bus home like they do. <laughs> Charge him double Yorkshire. <laughs> uh, treble, in fact. Uh, Stuart, it's been, uh, it's been great to have you on board for the day and um, many thanks for your time. Great. Thank you. Thanks to Stuart Cummins. Thanks to you for watching. Don't forget uh, JD at jonathandoidge.com if you want to make suggestions for future guests. You've been watching Sporting Lives with Jonathan Doidge. <laughs>